Welcome to the Religious Studies Project. My name is Christopher Cotter. David Robertson, who is normally with me every week, um, is not here. Um, so you've just got me. Um, consequently, I am not in one of Edinburgh's many hostelries. Uh, I'm not drinking beer. I've actually just drunk a cup of tea and I'm in my living room. Fancy that. Um, we were thinking that this was going to be our final podcast before our summer break. But what we wanted to do was put out a roundtable discussion that we recorded at the BSA Sociology of Religion conference um, back in April. Because we thought if we left that until September, um, it wouldn't be fair on all the fantastic people who um, contributed to it. It wouldn't be fair on you guys to not hear it. Um, and it would give us another week uh, to make sure that the... Uh, the final episode is uh, absolutely top notch. Uh, so what you've got here is a roundtable discussion on material religion. And we'll all introduce ourselves now, so just take it away, guys. Thank you. We are in Durham, uh, in a, the Samuel Smith's pub, the, uh, the Swan and Three Signets. Swan and Three Signets, yes. And we have been attending the British Sociological, Sociological Association's Sociology of Religion Study Group Conference on Material Religion. That's Socrel, for short. Yes, so Socrel from now on, please. And uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about, material religion. Uh, probably, is it useful, is it not, what we took from the conference. Um, I am Christopher Carter at Lancaster University. I'm not going to talk too much about what I'm doing, except I'm the, the non-religion guy. Uh, to my left is David Wilson. <coughs> um, just studies studies project regular. Yeah, yeah it's fine. Well, I suppose the listeners will probably be fed up hearing my name. Actually. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm um, George Ian Edies, um, PhD student in, at the University of Sydney, Australia. Um, yeah, PhD on material religion interlinked with philosophical and cultural studies understandings of materiality. Yeah. Um, I'm Rachel Hanneman at the University of Kent at Canterbury, and I'm exploring the role of the body in processes of religious transmission, uh, focusing on all girls Catholic schools. And, well, the viewers, the listeners will know my voice. I'm sure I'm David Robertson, the uh, uh, Religious Studies Project regular host. Um, so yeah, how... how where do we start, Chris? <clears throat> well, it's, um, b- before we kick this off, um, I just said that I've been to an entire conference on material religion and heard a lot of interesting papers, uh, but I'm still not entirely sure what material religion is more than simply looking at some stuff, you know, looking at things and stuff. Was that what well, uh, Marion, yeah, uh, Marion Bowman defined it in her, the first, the plenary is stuff about things and things about stuff yeah so I mean did, did anyone else get anything more than that sort of basic we pay well, attention to things I suppose my sense of it was just that um, looking at material representations of religion artifacts of one sort or another um, asking you know, how are religious traditions represented uh, materially just helps to bring out new aspects of traditions that we might not otherwise notice. And I don't know that it's a particularly sophisticated tool beyond that. But, you know, it's still a useful exercise. So in a sense, you're applying a, one particular definition of how religion can manifest and how traditions maintain themselves and the spaces that people use and how they represent cosmologies in those spaces and so on. So there's, there's a lot of thinking about the material representations of religion can actually bring out that you might not notice about this. Mm-hmm. And that has been quite productive. There has been a fair bit of scholarship doing that in recent mm-hmm. years. I certainly found that in my paper. I mean, it was essentially just a an overview of work which I'd presented before, but by taking that one particular lens and looking at, um, you know, through the material religion lens, if you will, um, it did kind of reveal a few aspects of the, particularly the economic side of it, which I just mm. never really considered mm. before. And so that was quite, yeah, quite enlightening. I suppose that's one way you can use it. You look at um, <coughs> material things that are relevant to religious practitioners, but that lets you take 
you know, your examination of their lives out of arenas that you would normally look at as sacred or religious, mm-hmm. and you know, look at how they might be practicing or still doing things in other areas of life as well. Mm-hmm. I found it um, useful as well in talking to my participants who are generally younger. It's a secondary school. Um, it's it's a good way to have them walk me through their process of meaning making to look at something physical and tactile and ask what that means to them or why they chose to arrange something or experience something in a certain way. It seems as if material religion, in a sense, is the study of religion trying to catch up with other developments that have occurred in other fields of academia, um, valorizing much more notions of embodiment and placement, ecology, um, materializing or rematerializing um, what some have called the really intense kind of neo Cartesian um, epistemologies undergirding a lot of, um, of, of a lot of uh, notions of you know belief versus practice, um, mind versus body binaries that maybe not as much, but that used to extensively permeate the discipline. Mm. I'm just going to completely on a tangent, perhaps, but um, when I was interviewing Peter Collins earlier, and it was a point that I had noticed, but I hadn't really brought explicitly to my mind, is that the whole conference seemed to be taking material religion at a very sort of small object level, like nothing was dealing with the... I didn't hear any papers dealing with the environment, with spaces, with buildings. Mm. It was all sort of amulets and statues <coughs> yeah. and things like that that people were talking about. Um, well, I think there can be a practical reason for that sometimes. Um, so just thinking about um, you know, one of the traditions I've looked at, inventory shamanism. Um, in traditional shamanism, there has been a lot of attention paid to costume and equipment like drums and amulets and things that um, <coughs> shamans use. But there is one really interesting um, article from the 60s that came out in Toronto University Press. I think Anisimov produced it. And he's an article here on the shaman's tent. Mm -hmm. He's always looking at the tent as a kind of um, building within which uh, the shaman gives uh, his or her performances. And the point he's making is that the inside of these things used to be covered in all sorts of mythological and cosmological representations Mm. that were almost could be read as stories almost like going into a church with stained glass windows. Mm. But of course things like Shaman's tents don't survive as easily as um, junkets and bustles and drums and things do because they're smaller and they tend to they tend to survive and end up in museums. Whereas a complete tent just won't very easily. Um, so the, the the bigger the scale that you're looking at uh, physically, mm. the harder it perhaps mm. comes in some traditions actually to get examples of what would give you that sort of work. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I believe there was one panel on um, architecture and Christianity. So there was, yes. 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 <laughs> um, just missed that one. Yeah, and it, I, there was a theme throughout sort of of... Um, whether a space that's once been made sacred maintains sacrality. So if a church is converted to something else, or um, if if the priest leaves the vestry and, um, and questions like that. Yeah. Um, I suppose just building off what you were saying there, David, um, with smaller objects, it's much easier to, inf- well, to infer intentionality. You know, if someone's carrying around something or wearing something, then there's a clear connection there was someone in a building you know or some people in a space it's difficult to know what what level of engagement they're having there you can, whereas it's a much more definite intentionality yeah you know, i mean using things. a focus on on small objects if you will um it works really well with um what goes on in in the sociology of religion and particularly recent manifestations of it, such as vernacular religion, everyday religion, lived religion, all these words that are appended to it. Um, It seems to be a move towards um, this notion of religion on the ground and what people, how people manifest their religiosities through the things around them. And most usually on an everyday scale, that's just the objects that they encounter. Um, and it might have been that 
such a focus was overrepresented because it's a sociology of religion conference. Yes. Um, there are works, um, you know, was it the Bloomsbury Stand um, had a book, Sacred and the City. Um, yeah, there are, you know, notions of, of spatialization and, and religion try and deal with kind of, um, you know, a larger um, focus than the, the object. Mm. Um, it may be that the, 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 just to build on what you were saying there, that the, the, the smallness and often by extension the everydayness of these objects underlines that the, the, the approach is meant to be a change from the traditional the approach institutions. Yeah. of yeah. institutions and churches yes. and, and yes. you know, large-scale ceremonies. So this is more, uh, it, it, it helps to shift the focus onto the everyday, the vernacular. The, yeah. the, the and also it gives you access to just how variable one, even one tradition can be when you start looking at individual practices, you know, individual practices within that. And it's also often easier to perceive um, the relationship that someone has with a small object. And it's less obvious sometimes when somebody walks into a big civic space whether their behaviour is changing at all. Are you supposed to be? Uh, are they doing anything different? And if so, what that, that can be a lot harder to pin down. I do though, think it's useful to look at bigger spaces like that because their meaning is much more communally constructed. So as opposed to looking at a smaller object and saying what what meaning has this for the individual, for the personal, you can look at an individual's response to a communally constructed meaning. Yeah. And actually I was at a conference in Chicago, which was looking at exactly this, and the ways in which religions change when they are conducted in very dense urban environments. Do they become something different by just the setting? Those relationships are a lot harder to articulate. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I think certainly um, the London itself does play a large role in the religious lives of the community that I work with in London. Um, very obvious. Mm. Um. To, to take things um, back a bit, sorry, I, I push things into a built environment kind of thing, um, back to the whole material religion approach, um, back to what it gives to religious studies. Uh, I think, David, you kick us off with your, your belief comment. Yeah, well, I mean, the, what George was saying earlier, I think, I, I think there's... And we can have our specific uh, criticisms of, of the way that it's handled, that the material religion approach has been handled in this particular conference. But I think to go back to sort of um, what the intention of it was and what what its potential utility for the for the discipline is, but I agree with George that it you know it can help shift this focus onto the onto the personal and the specific and the, the everyday. But I think another a quite important issue is that it is an attempt to avoid talking about belief. And actually, this kind of um, echoes what you were saying about the neo-Cartesian dualities. You know, I mean, this sort of idea of that we have we have beliefs which which um, which are different from our actions, or um, and specifically the. I mean, we can talk more about belief later, but the, the, the idea of sort of that we hold prepositional beliefs, which are things that we say, I believe this, and that they drive our actions, is, is a very problematic one, and a lot of people have, have criticised that. Um, and I think material religion is and a part of a broader attempt to avoid um, using the term at all, to try and describe the phenomena um, and the... The, the the utility that people put religion to without talking about these reified beliefs. Mm. Well, I wonder. Oh, sorry. Nope. I wonder if also um, the use of those material things as mediator might um, it might it might involve a reluctance to engage with the larger ideas of the divine on the part of the individual using them. Yes. So it's much easier to focus on something small and every day than it is to daily engage with that broad and complex concept. Mm. 
Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it's this this idea of the mediating. I, th- I, I, I kind of have a problem with that because that that is assuming the that is assuming the the you know sui generis divine kind of idea. I wonder actually if I, I kind of agree with you. I don't know if people are engaging with the divine on an everyday thing, but I think they are engaging with it, that with that little object or whatever the thing is that we're talking about. No, it's a very this notion of religion as media as mediation and mediatization is also this other kind of subset of works going on in the larger picture of material religion. Um, but I was wondering, it's um, a lot of work on 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 di- digital religion, if you will, and online manifestations of religiosities have also been placed within the remit of material religion. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a dilemma there because, yes, I mean, there are material agents at work, you know, when when a person's log on to log on on, over, you know, computers and iPads and iPhones and and all that kind of stuff. But is it immaterial? How how can we... How how does one grapple with this material and immaterial binary that... um, uh, it, it's like it, it, that everyone kind of constantly grapples with when yeah. talking about material religion. I would say if there is a demonstra- demonstrably um, immaterial realm, then it's the online realm, surely. It's the, you know, yeah. That's one reality that we all interact with all the time, which is definitely not there in any physical sense. But then we get it very real. Yeah. It's... I don't know if I always have to theorise it too much. It's simply that by thinking in terms of the material and non-material distinction, you are just imposing or projecting a dividing line onto whichever religious tradition you're looking at. And it just helps to bring things to the surface. So that if I think in terms of material religion, I notice these things in this tradition. Yeah. Then that implies its opposite. So if I think in terms of the unity of your in this tradition, what else do I notice mm-hmm. by thinking in those terms? And that, you're doing both of those. Um, it's not necessarily an intensive theoretical exercise, but it can, as a practical matter, still help you notice things that you might otherwise miss. Mm-hmm. Just because you're applying that particular template or that boundary between these two things. Mm-hmm. You know, the, a year on, you might apply some other boundaries or yeah. distinction to the same tradition, and then start noticing other things. Mm-hmm. In saying that, are we reinscribing a boundary or binary between theory and practice? Then? That too, yes. Yeah, mm. And we're also. Uh, creating a boundary between material and immaterial. Yeah, so yeah. in some ways it actually reinforces that. <laughs> yeah, because what we were saying earlier was that you can end up broadening the material approach so it includes virtual worlds, words, sounds, smells. Um, but then of course once something becomes everything it means nothing at all. Yeah. So yeah. It is always helpful, I think, mm-hmm. to bring in mind the opposite. So it uh, yeah. Because as soon as you, st- you come out of the state of light, all religion is material religion. Mm. Actually, the materiality of religion becomes irrelevant because it's, it's not anything in particular. You're just throwing it yeah. in category. And it, it, it's no use to do anything. <clears throat> Could it be because there's confusion in this use of the term material and its various um, variants, matter, material, materiality, materialism, materialization? Um, do we need more <laughs> rigor in our particular employments? Oh, that's something I always um, argue for, because unless you're actually thoughtful and sharing about the definitions that you're using, rather than just jumping in a user term, then you may not notice yourself uh, what's coming out of that exercise. <laughs> and also other scholars listening to you might completely miss what you're actually saying. So you've, you've got to get a definition of your term, I think, always at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And that's not to make the claim that your definition is the right one. It's just the one you're using for a particular mm-hmm. purpose, or to see what happens by applying it. Absolutely. Yeah. As an experiment. Yeah. Because I think to go back to um, auditory culture and gestures and, and things of that nature, it's also important to consider what the participants consider. So although in, you know, 
my definition of material religion, a gesture or um, um, someone did a, a presentation about sound calling forth the Ark of the Covenant and then the uh, participants experiencing that as a real physical presence. And so I think that's where some difficulty arises that if something that I might not consider material myself is, is considered mm. material by the people participating in the ritual. Well, that's why it's important to be clear um, what we mean by terms of mm. yeah. Because you can have three scholars will stand up and give a paper using exactly mm. the same term. And they will yeah. mean three different things about it. Absolutely. But you don't realise that. You listen to them and actually start picking apart what they're coming up with. Mm. Mm. Uh, naturally, if they had all used exactly the same definition, you could then have had a direct conversation between them so they disagreed with each other. Mm-hmm. They could get engaged debate. So as long as they're using different definitions, they can all just talk and ask each other. Yeah. That's the worst edited volumes that you read sometimes. Yes. <laughs> like every chapter is using a different... You know, I think mm. uh, if you're going to be an editor, at least get people to be consistent in their terms. Yeah. <laughs> so far as you can. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Or be explicit when they're not. Yes. <laughs> okay. I don't know, there's a lot of academics just don't do this exercise of you know, being clear about the definitions. Maybe it's just too boring for a lot of people. I mean, two, two, two points coming from that. One is directly related to, well, if, if people, if you say believers, you know, feel things as you know material things in in the world. You know, do we treat it as physical materiality? And I was discussing, uh, like I can't remember with whom last night, but about about even your know, dreams and our thoughts and everything. Every 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 thought that we have is embodied in some way. So you can end up thinking about the mental, but you know, even if you're in a virtual world, like spinning the virtual mandala, you're still virtually interacting with material objects which mm-hmm. which aren't well yeah I mean that's that's what we were saying earlier on about it. if you if you widen the pie of what you count as material so far then ultimately it becomes an exercise of futility if you say anything's material but there aren't very different uh, even straightforward senses of what materiality is about because you know, there's a sense of materiality which is a term to be significance rather than physicality mm. you know is this a material concern uh, yeah. can mean, is this one of the matters? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that has nothing to do with physical or non-physical. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're taking a completely different angle and division mm-hmm. of the word in that sense. Yeah, but it seems as if what we're saying is that material religion has does have some value and does mm-hmm. have um, can bring about some really, really interesting work um, as long as scholars empl- employ it with much more rigour than we've mm, seen yeah. of late. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And to say this sort of Timothy Fitzgerald line, but we don't need to call that material religion. It's just it's a material approach to standard mm. religious studies. I mean, it's not really a distinct. Mm-hmm. It's it's a method. Well, it's a method uh, and it's concerned with you know, issues of materiality of one sort or another. Well, this, that goes back to what I was saying. Right? Yeah, I, it's I, not the religion that's material or non-material. It's, it's the approach. We're examining it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, a lot of, a lot of actually what we've seen at the conference has been, it's more languages a lot of yeah. the time. Mm-hmm. It's quite often they'll, they'll show you an object and then the rest of the talk is deconstructing how insiders read the language of that object or like the clothes today when you have the symbols and this means certain thing and then in the insider group it means something different. A lot of the time it's actually language and I have a bit of an issue with that because I'm not sure whether, I, I don't think a language is material. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's something which happens between, it's a way of yeah. conceptualising something between different parties. I mean, this is quite fascinating because the this current material turn that we're seeing in so many academic fora was precipitated by a rejection um, of what some scholars have called linguisticisms, mm. the linguistic turn. Um, um, you mean the like sort of post-Wittgenstein kind of philosophy? Well, post-post-structuralist yeah. and... Um, this notion that language has been granted too much power, to quote um, Karen Barad, who's um, a former scholar in this in this um, wider material 
juncture mm -hmm. <laughs> within the academy, you could say. Um, and so bringing in notions of the material and materiality to the study of religion, um, I kind of feel like scholars ignore or forget the wider intellectual and genealog genealogical history of the notion of materiality and the material. Um, <laughs> which which is this notion of genealogy? Can you unpack that for us? Well, <laughs> briefly, just that sense that um, discourse analysis in the yes. of religion perhaps became a bit too dominant. Um, everything you see in terms of what is signified, mm. kind of this language and conversation that's going on. But this is exactly what I'm seeing. Mm. Most of, a lot of the papers that we've, that we've seen have done just that. They have done exactly They've that. done exactly, yes. been examining the discourses that evolved around the imagery or symbolism of particular mm. objects. And of course, well, maybe that teaches us then that um, discourse analysis um, the understanding of religion as a conversation deserves to be significant. Because if we tried to bring in this concept of materiality as a way of countering that emphasis, and then by mm -hmm. naturally all that happens, we end up back in the same place. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, a good reason for it. it's one of those things where you can only know about someone's intentionality relating to an object. You can only know what mm -hmm. someone's interpretation of a practice is by mm -hmm. hearing it. Right. Or interpreting it through mm. language. Mm. So even if you are yeah. paying, you're just like, I'm entirely doing practice, you still have to mm -hmm. put that practice into discourse, which then brings you back to the same. Because on well, a physical yeah. item in religious traditions, they do serve a kind of mnemonic function, you know, they're a reminder of conversation mm. that is ongoing. Um, and that's the one of the etymologies of the word, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I can't it's remember which one. <laughs> is it relegary? <laughs> I think. I think they are more than just that, though, because surely if they were just reminders of the conversation, then... Oh, they can be much more than that, yes. So I think there is still relevance. P perhaps if we keep bringing it around to language, we need to work on the way that we're approaching these yeah. objects, but I think there is somewhat more than just... Yeah, I the danger in always bringing it back into language and conversation is that um, that can overlook the significance of something for a religious practitioner. You know, it's not just a conversation involved in this can be something that is overwhelming for mm -hmm. it's our ultimate significance that beyond language. But are we disembodying language in, 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 in speaking this way about it? Is, mm -hmm. it? is it language material sometimes? I know that's that might be a really <laughs> kind of radical <clears throat> well, yeah, well, yeah, some people would say it's very material because you're using a uh, yeah, that, and almost physical energy, and some sounds can yeah. hit you if they're strong enough or deep enough. But then we're back to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're back to this. Yeah. I mean, it could it be a fundamental thing to, to do with the, our, the way that we research is we have to express things in language to disseminate, you know, to share knowledge mm. um, and maybe just to bring in the sort of current trendy cognitive science, like that's is that the only maybe method that's there that manages to get at potentially get at experiences which are happening internally which are not being mediated through language are there other methodologies out there which avoid having to Get a person's get at a person's experience through their language. One of the um, major aspects of what I'm um, researching involves the fact that I um, was raised Catholic and am no longer practicing Catholic. Um, and so this this idea of um, material objects and then also of, of embodied practices um, has a lot of significance because being in those Catholic spaces. I sometimes find myself um, unconsciously reverting to, so I um, several times have walked into the chapel and anointed myself with holy water, which is not a, an object or um, an embodied practice that is part of my current, but it, so it, that's why I think it's something more, because it's not part of a... a <sighs> discourse that, uh, that's currently a part of my life it's a different mm. more visceral I think mm. yeah 
and and this how to access that particularly in like you know you have that intuitive sense and we all probably have an intuitive sense that you know someone is experiencing something that they're not mm-hmm. verbalizing that they're not conscious of but how do you access that as a researcher over there right putting it into oh, so how do you access things that the practitioner themselves might not want to articulate and feel slightly with? because if you then force someone to articulate mm-hmm. something they don't feel is appropriate for the verbal articulation um, how are you actually getting to what it is that's going on there <laughs> mm-hmm. somebody was talking about that wasn't there there was a paper about was it the Amish women yes. did anybody else see that mm-hmm. she was saying that they, they, they didn't articulate any broader systems it was like they did mm-hmm. A certain thing because they were ill, and that was that was as much as they would say. She had no access to it at all, mm. um, but she attempted to gain that access through the material expressions mm. of them shopping at Kmart or whatever it was. I can't yeah. remember. Mm. Somebody has been referenced an awful lot during this conversation. <laughs> you know, all of us have referenced somebody. Well, I thought you were going to tell us somebody that had been referenced. Or no, no, just yeah. that. somebody's been very busy. Yeah. yeah, I thought about getting out my my booklet so we had access to everybody's mm. names with their presentations. Yeah. <laughs> but on a similar note, um, Abby Day's presentation yesterday was um, about your current research, which is with sort of older women born in like the 20s and 30s in churches. And and she was talking about how she had to become a member of, you know, become a member of the church community and start attending all these events. And within about three or four weeks, she started to, you know, uh, know who was a stranger, started to get added to the flower rota and things like that without really ever talking about it. Um, so there, and, and there's, you know, she talks a lot about the whole tea rota thing, you know, like we always talk about the, 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 old, the old women doing the teas and all that sort of, but that's all sort of a material expression of a sort of very, well, quote, traditional, unquote, form of Christianity, which isn't vocalised, it isn't talked about, and, and you can only get access to that through sort of sustained ethnographic field work and through participating and dealing with the same objects and that sort of thing. And then you still come to the same problem of then you have to go to a conference and present it mm-hmm. and talk about it. But, uh, yeah. And I suppose that is, yeah, that learned reading, to go back to the linguistic, of those cultural things isn't something that you can instantly transmit, mm-hmm. hence the, the return to mm-hmm. discourse. Like what you were saying yesterday, David, about like the the, the news media being an appropriate medium for uh, for religion to to engage with. You know, it doesn't lend itself to the wrong sort of materiality. It ties back though to what I was saying about belief. I, sorry, I've gone no, it again. It's, it's something which is weighing heavy on my mind. Um, is it the case that in well, for Abby Day, it was um, uh, she was get, gaining the re- research. She was becoming an insider, but for, for an ordinary person who wasn't an academic, they, it would be the same process by which they would be inculcated into the community. Mm. But is it that you do this and you slowly gain the belief, or is it that it's this manipulation of material things, this involvement in, in circles of people, is that what it is? is there, do we need to posit something more? Is it sim- simply using these objects in the context in, in the, that if other people are using them which ascribe a certain meaning, a certain set of symbolic languages that are interchanging between the group, p- a potential of material religion is to try and look at it from that sort of um, radically de, um, de-enchanted, if you like, where we don't have... Because, the, you know, it's... It's got to be. We're talking about objects. The point of it is to be the objective world, not this, not the subjective world. There's lots of that in religious studies. Too much of that, perhaps. I think is what Morgan's trying to suggest. Mm. Well, mm. 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 them. Yeah. In, in, a, in, a, in a good way. In a good way. Yeah. There's a question at least to be asked as to whether the objectification. Um, this thinking in terms of things 
Uh, there's a re-education of the uh, is actually a good way to be looking at religion. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that's a question that has to be asked, at least. Is it a suitable site for religion? <laughs> <laughs> um, can we embody religion in this kind of discourse? I think it's also interesting. Um, we've heard a lot of papers at this conference that try to flip notions of agency onto the material itself, mm-hmm. away from human intentionality. Um, a lot of work in material religion, a lot of valuable work, I think, um, tries to speak of notions of relationality between human object, human non-human mm-hmm. kind of um, relationships and, and um, communication. Yes, I mean, that, uh, there are certain religious traditions that, you know, there will be things that that way of looking at them does bring out very effectively. I mean, I think, again, in terms of mediumistic or mm-hmm. spirit communication traditions, shamanic traditions, where <clears throat> non-human, uh, but uh, it's uh, yeah. entities are communicated with. Also, physical objects, like uh, stones, uh, for example. Some will be significant, but it's felt to be uh, you know, in one terminology, it's some element of spirit present here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's that presence that gives that thing its significance. And other stones might just be stones, mm-hmm. but there are certain stones that are more than just stones. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you are in relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Well, you're you're paraphrasing, paraphrasing Graham Harvey there, I think. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which yeah. is great, because yeah. he is another scholar who does this exact thing absolutely. that I'm talking about, about trying yeah. to avoid talking about beliefs. He mm-hmm. won't ascribe beliefs yes. anymore. The... the, the as he puts it, the old animism was that it was ascribing a naive belief that mm. things had spirits living in them. Now he says that's not that's not the correct way to understand a, um, an animist view, uh, worldview. Nowadays he defines it as animism is a, um, a, a set of etiquettes for relationships with other beings, some of whom are not human. Other persons and humans. Persons, persons, yes, that's right. Some of whom are not humans. Yes, it's, it's the notion of etiquette of, of a world full of yeah. um, personhoods. Mm-hmm. Mm. Which is something he's developed out of his examination of taboos, because yeah. taboos are not about forbidden things, mm-hmm. it's more about knowing how to behave towards them correctly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yes, the, the, sh- the shoes on the table is taboo, yeah. but yes. on the floor, that's perfectly that's appropriate. They're, no, they're not forbidden. I think it, yeah, I think it might just be a case of. Um, trying to think of corresponding um, ways to think through all these questions. Perhaps it is, I mean, perhaps it's the case that this, um, talking about belief hasn't subsided. It's just um, stepped aside for, the, for, the, for this current moment yeah, yeah. In, in our discipline and that, um, you know, once this kind of massive flurry of work if it will wane or if mm-hmm. it won't maybe then um, yeah you'll, perhaps it, I mean, will come back. perhaps it is just that it's a it's a um, sort of right let's see if we can make this work yeah. without talking about it if it works it'll probably carry on mm-hmm. as, a, mm-hmm. as a tradition and if it doesn't then at least we'll have found out that's the thing it, I think, I think it. it's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's quite new the, uh, although although the questions are not new I mean no. <laughs> we are it's a rematerialization. It's, it's not. I mean, there's such a long history of, um, you know, scholars and, and writers thinking through the relationship between religion, matter, and and, and materiality. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something quite idiosyncratic about what's happening um, in recent years. It's a rematerialization. So not. Um, Rather than a materialisation. Mm-hmm. 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 It's interesting. Mm-hmm. The material studies developed out of linguistic solution. Mm-hmm. 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 That's where the discipline has obviously came from. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's always been a sort of fundamental um, sense of being a home in terms of thinking about like, discussions, dialogues, yes, conversations. Yes, yes. <coughs> and, they're, and they're being influenced by this other work yeah. that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's at play. Mm-hmm. Um, it may just be a testing of that so familiarity mm-hmm. to see if there are other things that will help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. And then may or may not. Maybe we're just <laughs> not going to wear that experiment to still be carried out and the results aren't in yet. <laughs> I guess we're sort of looking for, you know, a sort of optimistic conclusion to the discussion. You know, what is the... Uh, what does the future hold? Um, I think I'd be right in saying that, whether from this conference or from our wider research, that we're all quite now more aware of the material aspects of our own research and much more likely in future to notice material aspects that we might not have before. Um, but I guess, does anyone have any sort of burning sort of positives that we... Or, or, well, burning points that we haven't made yet that you would like to... No, not that I haven't made several times already. <laughs> no, just, just, to, just, yeah, yeah. just to say that I, I think it's, 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 right, it, it, it's part of a broader trend, I think, yeah. which is questioning this idea of belief, and uh, which I think is a positive step away from the Protestant bias of the that the you know the Protestant genealogy of, of the discipline. So I don't think we're there yet, but I think with this and with what some other people are doing, then we could end up in quite an interesting place. I know um, within the, uh, the work that I do, looking at uh, sort of mediumship and shamanic traditions, um, it's always been <coughs> something I've been aware of that belief doesn't really figure very much in the dialogues, in those traditions. Yeah. And <coughs> to the extent that belief exists, it's only their general sense of the things that people trust in as real. Yeah, exactly. And it's not, that's not the same as belief in terms of a set of mental beliefs that you subscribe to. Yeah, exactly. You're thinking more in terms of a world view that people build up bit uh-huh. by bit, either mm-hmm. through the society that they're born into, the practices they participate in, mm-hmm. and then bit by bit, you know, they build a world view that connects very closely with their own personal experience. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I think I think we need to, to yeah to, to, to take that and, and to start talking about knowledge rather than belief, mm. because we've made this it whole is, separation yes. between them and it just doesn't mm. make mm. sense. Yeah. And also that whole process of learning and getting beyond yourself. Um, and all what I mean by that is, you know, accepting and trusting the reality of a material world that is beyond ourselves. Yeah. Um, that is a step that every human being has to make at some point in order to function socially at all. Yeah. Um, and, see, so, you know, religion comes out of that process. I've been very good and haven't mentioned non-religion <laughs> at all. I, um, I, 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 I hear one coming. <laughs> no, but, but, just, but I mean, what the material approach does is that there, there were some papers at this conference and I've seen some others. Um, it just, well, say secular instead of non-religious, but you know, it, it allows a space for you can see the same practices and the same relationships to objects happening, be it people in religious communities, people out with religious communities, people who disavow any religious commitment. But, but, you, know, you can see the same use of space, the same um, you know investment in certain objects, and it, it allows a bridge to sort of cross that that line where you say, well, this group are religious and this group aren't, if you look at the way people are engaging with the material environment around them, um, so rather than it being a material religion approach, it's generally a material approach um, can allow you to, to navigate that those fuzzy waters in between. Uh, I mean, if we start talking in terms of different traditions whereby people acquire socially useful knowledge... Yeah, yeah. we don't talk about religion at all. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what needs to happen. Because you could include that <laughs> the Western scientific tradition. Indeed. And um, yeah. Uh, final thoughts. Um, I mean I, I suppose I think that the yeah, the study of um, material culture is is useful across most social interactions and religions just mm. one of those and Maybe well, no, I think that's good. That's yeah, yeah, done. Good. Good. <laughs> I mean, as a, as a final point, um, just playing on on um, the impressions that we have got from from this this conference that have brought us all here um, the last few days, um, and this notion of you know trying to bring some kind of you know theoretical, methodological, um, conceptual rigor back into the questions that we are asking in the vein of of this. Um, 
current trend in our discipline. Um, maybe it behooves scholars to, um, yeah, look at the way in which other disciplines are dealing with the same kind of questions of matter, materiality, materialism, and um, and and as as everyone's saying, and then and then to look at religion as merely just one off. What was one of a, a social, um, human, non human assemblage of, of relationalities? I'll leave it there. <laughs> Articulated that so much more elegant. <laughs> Boom. So, you've just been listening to the roundtable discussion that we recorded um, in Durham. Um, so, I hope you very much enjoyed that, and I hope that you will come back next week for our final podcast. I just wanted to mention that the Religious Studies Project is presented in association with the British Association for the Study of Religions. And uh, we are very grateful uh, for their support. Um, Our Facebook following is continuing to go up. Uh, You can like us on Facebook there, follow us on Twitter, you can download the podcasts and subscribe through iTunes or through email and things like that. Um, And remember about our Amazon links um, over the summer if you're buying all sorts of DVDs or barbecue equipment or whatever. Um, All that remains for me to say, as per usual, thanks for listening. Mm